I'm Senior Fellow and Director of the Europe Program here at CSIS, and I can tell all of you um, have come with a very important purpose because you would not come through the, the wind and rain storm uh, that, uh, that you had to, to join us today uh, because you are as excited as I am for the next hour and a half of conversation. We are so delighted to welcome Professor Chris Clark um, here with us. Um, for uh, an incredibly important conversation uh, as we talk about the centenary of the First World War. Um, and uh, Professor Clark, whom uh, so many of you know, is the Professor of Modern European History at the University of Cambridge, and of course the must, much celebrated author of The Sleepwalkers, How Europe Went to War in 1914. Um, and of course, New storm clouds are also gathering uh, on the European horizon, uh, certainly today as we speak, as we watch events unfold in eastern Ukraine. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Professor Clark to the podium. He's going to give us a presentation on some of the broader themes of the sleepwalkers, and then we're going to come up and have a bit of a, uh, a conversation on, on some issues both of 100 years ago, but perhaps uh, bringing more to the modern uh, time and discuss uh, current events today, and then I'm going to unleash all of you uh, on uh, Professor Clark. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Clark. Thank you. <coughs> well, thank you very much, and congratulations on getting here. Can you, can you hear me? I, I, they told me that Washington was lovely in the spring, and, um, <laughs> and I haven't been disappointed. Um, I wanted to start just by um, showing you a couple of images just to put us into 1914 very briefly before we sort of pull ourselves back out again. It wasn't a very good year. Um, there's a couple who are about to have what I think you could fairly describe as a very bad day. Um, he is Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke arch and heir apparent uh, to, to the Austro-Hungarian Austro throne. She's Zofie Chotek, his wife, the, the um, descendant of a very distinguished Czech lineage. Not distinguished enough, really, to be regarded by the Habsburg royal house as appropriate material for um, Habsburg royalty, but um, uh, for which reason she was never allowed to travel with him, for example, in the open carriage, the royal open carriage in Vienna, or to sit next to him at dinner. She always sat far away because she was of such supposedly lowly stock. And that's one reason why on the 28th of June she insisted on sitting with him all day in the car, because among other things, uh, it was a chance in this attractive, handsome, uh, a rather oriental looking city on the edge, on the periphery of the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire to officiate together as they both imagined they would do when uh, her husband eventually acceded to the throne. And of course, um, the day was important. It was a very important date. The 28th of June was their wedding anniversary. So for that reason too, she insisted on being with him uh, in the open car. It also happened to be the uh, anniversary of the, uh, the defeat of the Serbian armies at Kosovo Polje at the, at the Field of Blackbirds by, the, by an Ottoman force, by a mixed Ottoman and Slav force, um, an event from the year 1389 which um, brought the existence of an independent Serbia to an end, an event which might seem to have been very remote, but which in fact to many Serb, um, you know, national, nationally minded Serbs um, felt like, uh, felt very intimate, felt, felt like it belonged to a very close past, a past that was still remembered, a past that was still felt. So on both sides there, um, a lot of emotion riding on that day. Here we see them greeting the crowds at the uh, Sarajevo railway station. As you can see, he has ostrich feathers on his hat. I'll come back to those on his helmet. I'll come back to those feathers in a moment. Um, here you see a map of the Balkans in 1911 and 1914. I've just included this partly because one can never look often enough at maps of the Balkans. Um, <coughs> they're just, they never exhaust their interest. Um, but the main thing is I've just offered these two pictures. It's a little bit like the two pictures you see on a cereal packet where there are, you're, you're asked to identify the differences between, al between two almost identical images. Um, and you can see that in 1911, there's no Albania and suddenly with an almost inaudible plop, Albania appears, in, Albania appears in 1913. You can see that Serbia changes shape. It acquires almost its entire um, territorial size again. It increases by more than 100%. Bulgaria changes its extent, so does Romania. And all this happens, of course, because of the, the helter-skelter retreat of Ottoman power um, across southeastern Europe. The other thing to bear in mind is just the intimate relationship between the Serbian polity and Austria-Hungary. Belgrade it looks on that map almost 
as if it's inside the dual monarchy, inside Austria-Hungary. It was right on the border. It was a few minutes' drive from the Serbian capital to Austrian territory. Um, okay, this is the closest that the early 20th century had to Google Earth. Um, <laughs> it's an engraving from the Baydecker travel guide, and it shows Sarajevo. And what you see there is Sarajevo like a cupped hand. Um, it's in, set, situated in, the, in a river valley, the River Miljačka. There's a road running along the valley, the, the, um, the Appel Key, along which the car, the, 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 the sort of cavalcade, the motorcade, bearing Franz Ferdinand and his wife, traveled eastwards across the city towards the, um, the Rathaus. It's marked there as the Rathaus, the, the city hall, which you can see there, um, in just next to the Bazaar district. And what happened next um, is with almost, um, with a sort of brutal simplicity, illustrated by this diagram, as they passed the Chumuria Bridge, a bomb was thrown by a young man called Nedelko Chabrinovich. The bomb missed the second car and exploded under the third car, causing some injuries, but superficial injuries. At this point, you might have thought that the visit to Sarajevo would be called off. And indeed, various people proposed to Franz Ferdinand that he leave the car and that they leave the city. He didn't like being told what to do. Um, he suffered from a syndrome which, for, whom, for which the technical name is grumpy old man. Um, it happens to a lot of us. As we get older, we get more and more irritated by less and less. He didn't like being told what to do, and he said, the man is obviously insane. Have him taken to an asylum. We'll continue as planned. Uh, and so the journey went on, and they arrived at the Rathaus, the city, city hall there. Um, and what I've, what the reason I've included this image is because you can see many ge of the gentlemen standing there are wearing fezzes. That's because this was, a, uh, the, in, as, as far as the the, the elite, the urban elite of Sarajevo was concerned. This was a very Muslim town. The, the mayor was a Bosnian Muslim, and you can see them all there greeting the couple. Um, among them is Mehmet Churcic, the Bosnian mayor of Sarajevo, to whom fell the, um, the unfortunate task, or the unenviable task, of welcoming the couple, which he did with a speech he had prepared, um, which by the time they arrived was completely inadequate to the situation because the opening words were, it is with sentiments of the deepest joy that the citizens of Sarajevo welcome your highnesses to this city, whereupon he was interrupted by Franz Ferdinand, who said, you know, deepest joy, welcome. Is this how you welcome your guests? With bombs. Um, of course, he, he had a point. Um, uh, but th at this point, his wife was seen to whisper something to him along the lines of, you know, um, it's not his fault, dear, let him continue. And, um, and so he let him go on. And what happened next is shown here in this very fanciful image from a, the, the, the Petit Journal, uh, a contemporary Parisian journal, which is, you can see illustrations in the Petit Journal all over history books from this era because they're such attractive illustrations, beautiful color lithographs. Of course, this has nothing to do with what actually happened on that day. Um, it's highly fanciful. There is young Gavrilo Princip, um, wearing a sort of dap d rakishly angled hat, taking a shot from, uh, and, uh, and they're standing up like figures from an operetta. He's saying, I die. In fact, nothing like this happened. They remained seated exactly as they had been. The shots were so accurate that they, they didn't move. Uh, they, in fact, she was slipping into a coma by the time the, the car pulled back and, and traveled back at speed down the Appel Key. And it was then that he uttered the words, which became very famous uh, within the next few hours of the, uh, uh, as, as the media picked this up. It sort of went viral. He said to her, Zofal, Zofal, sterbe nicht, bleib am Leben für unsere Kinder. Sophie, Sophie, don't die, stay alive for our children. Um, and um, this became part of the sort of media-generated wave of emotion um, which followed the, the assassination of a man who actually hadn't been very popular, but became, as it were, a figure of emotional identification after his death, partly because of the details about his private life that were revealed uh, following his, his uh, murder. And there we see the picture of the arrest of a suspect. This is often shown in history books as the arrest of Gabriel Princip. Of course, it would be <laughs> astonishing if someone had managed with a 1914 camera to capture the assassination just by accident, um, and that indeed did not happen. This photographer was pre-warned by the police that they were, they were carrying out a dragnet, they were going to arrest suspects, and he took his camera along and, and uh, took this shot of the arrest of a suspect called Ferro Bea, um, who was distantly connected to the network behind the assassination, but in fact was completely innocent and was released shortly afterwards. But um, the photographer then cleverly sold this image as a picture of the arrest of Princip, and it was syndicated around the world, and he made a lot of money out of this picture of something um, which claimed to be a picture of something it wasn't. Um, there's a picture of Gavrilo Princip, <coughs> a slender young man, not a, not a terrorist in our contemporary sense, not someone who rejoiced in suffering or death, um, a very um, ge rather gentle, um, rather finely built. Uh, he was probably suffering from, from skeletal tuberculosis by the time this photograph was taken. Um, he and his, his comrades 
um, you know, were not terrorists in, in our contemporary sense at all. They were, they were rather uh, high-minded idealist boys. They, there was not too much in the way of alcohol, no bi visits to brothels, um, very little in the way of girlfriends. They were um, rich in ideals and poor in experience. They were, but, but perhaps partly for that reason, they were um, excellent. The, the sorts of stuff that irredentist movements um, so often find it easy to feed on. And um, just one last thought about the background to the assassinations. There was a, you know, a, a very oblique and indirect link to Serbia. The, the Serbian government as such did not endorse and did not help to plan or did not, and did not support this assassination. On the contrary, the Prime Minister, Nikola Pašić, an extremely far-sighted and intelligent, shrewd uh, politician, um, was profoundly opposed to any activity of this kind and had done what he could to repress these networks. But on the other hand, they, th this, this kind of irredentist activity was supported from deep within the heart of, the, of Serbian military intelligence, and in particular by the head of Serbian military intelligence, this man here, Dragutin Dimitrievich, known as, um, as Apis. So there was a link there to the Serbian state, but we have to be differentiated about the character of that link. We can't say Serbia as such was responsible um, for these assassinations. Well, as you know, on the morning of that day, Europe was still at peace, and none of the great powers was planning uh, a war of aggression against another power, and yet only 37 days later, um, Europe was at war. And the war that followed from that moment um, has rightly been described as the original catastrophe of modernity. The Urkatastrophe is a term widely used in the German literature, the primal catastrophe. It consumed four major empires, um, the Russian, the Austro-Hungarian, the German, and the, um, the Ottoman, uh, sort of multi-ethnic Ottoman Empire. It, it consumed, much more importantly, the deaths of between 10 and 20 million um, soldiers and civilians, depending on how you do the count. It accounted for between 15 and 21 million serious, wound, serious wounded. Light, light wounds were treated in theater. They have never been counted. Um, but you know, the presence of mutilated uh, and badly damaged veterans in all the, the, the belligerent societies after uh, this war was part of the visual memory, uh, an indelible part of the visual memory of this conflict. And I think Fritz Stern, the, the German emigre um, US historian, um, was right when he described the First World War as the disaster from which all the other disasters of the 20th century sprang. Because without this war, it's hard to imagine the rise of Italian fascism. It's hard to imagine the Bolshevik October Revolution. It's easy to imagine the February Revolution. Everyone had predicted a collapse or a crisis of Tsarism, which would be followed by a transition to a, some kind of constitutional monarchy, a seizure of power by Kadyets, by liberals, by uh, nationalists, and possibly by the more moderate elements of the Russian left. But no one had predicted the kind of uh, coup-like seizure of power followed by the establishment of a one-party state that actually occurred in Russia following the October Revolution. Um, and of course, that means uh, we have to count the five million consumed, the five million lives consumed by the Russian Civil War that followed that, and everything that came out of the establishment of a Bolshevik system. Um, <coughs> lastly, it's hard to imagine the rise of National Socialism in Germany without this war, without its profoundly disorganizing effect on German society. Uh, and therefore, it's hard to imagine also the Holocaust. So we, we might be looking at a very, very different 20th century without this war. My former colleague at Cambridge, now at the University of Yale, Adam Tooze, is right, I think, when he refers in the book, he's just written a book called The Deluge, which is about the long-term impact of this war. Um, he's right, I think, when he ref refer refers to the unhinging of the world system, the un an unhinging of the global system by this war. And he goes into great detail about the various vectors of disorganization that, um, that come out of this extraordinary conflict. Now, when I first encountered the story of how this war came about, and in particular the events in Sarajevo and the story of the July crisis, you know, one of the most intricate and complex crises, perhaps the most complex event of all times, uh, when I first encountered this material as a schoolboy in Sydney in the 1970s, a great deal of period charm had accumulated around the story of how this war came about. There was a lot of tennis and waltzing. Uh, it was a, last, a sort of last summer scenario. It was a, like a merchant ivory um, a drama. And the, the, our, our, our chief sort of historiographical guide to these events was the wonderful Barbara Tuckman, whose books, beautifully written narrative histories, still read today, um, dwelt with love, in loving detail on uniforms, the details of uniforms, on the extravagant menus for gala dinners, on Lord Salisbury riding to the House of Commons on London's first pneumatically tired tricycle, pushed by his valet, James. Um, and 
you know, the, as one read uh, of, of, the, of the ornamentalism, to use David Canadine's turn, uh, turn, term, as one read of the ornamentalism of, of, this, of this sort of last phase in, in European court culture, one couldn't help feeling that if these people's helmets had gaudy green ostrich feathers on them, then perhaps their dreams, their arguments, their ideas also had gaudy green ostrich feathers. Perhaps they were bygone people from a moribund, bygone world, people who had nothing to say to us anymore, people locked in a drama which belonged to a distant past. But if we look again at these events from today's perspective, the early, early-ish 21st century, um, then it seems to me one can't help but be struck by the raw modernity of these events. They don't begin, even if we think of the events of that, that day, the 28th of June, it doesn't start with prancing horses and golden carriages. It starts with a line of automobiles, with a motorcade. And if you run through the events on the Appel Quay on the 28th of June, 1914, you can't help but have the film of, of, of November 1963 in Dallas playing at the back of your head. It starts with a squad of suicide bombers. There were seven young men who had gone to Sarajevo. There were suicide bombers in a very um, literal sense. They were carrying potassium cyanide, which they tried to take. The two most active members of the squad, Chavrinovich and Princip, both tried to take their poison, but the poison was bad. Um, it, it, and, and, and behind them was an underground organization, a, f a hazy, fuzzy underground organization, difficult to pin down, no paper trails, um, with a very oblique relationship to any sovereign state uh, authority. Um, an organization driven by, I'm thinking, I'm talking now about the Black Hand, or Uyedinyenye ili Smrt, unity or death, or union or death, as it was called. Um, an organization, extraterritorial extra or transterritorial, which operated, sort of operated out of Belgrade, but also had networks in Bosnia and Herzegovina um, as well. An organization marked by a cult of death, um, revenge, and self-sacrifice. And there again, we can think of sort of contemporary analogs. So in many ways, these, th th these events seem to speak to us more freshly and more intimately than they did in the era of the Cold War. And there are other reasons why this has happened as well, I think. Our compass has shifted in other ways as well. The, the first, there's the fact that um, 9-11 the, the reminded us of the power of an event. Now, it would be, it would be absurd to compare the carnage of 9-11 with the killing of two people on Franz Josef Street in 1914. But nevertheless, what 9-11 did was to remind us of how an event can change the chemistry of politics. And I think the, the events of the 28th of June certainly did that for Austria-Hungary. They created a, 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 an extremely militant um, and unanimous desire for war um, in Vienna, which had not been there before. And then there's, I think, the fact that we're still coming to terms, we're coming to terms right now in the recent days with the end of bipolar stability. We're no longer in a bipolar Cold War world where the global system is disciplined by the standoff between two superpowers. Um, we're in a world with um, a titan, a weary titan was the term that was often used um, of, the United, of, of Great Britain in 1914 or the last years before the outbreak of war. It's sometimes now used about Washington. Not that Washington, this is not a titan that's actually weakening, but it may be growing somewhat weary of its uh, complex international role. It's a world with rising powers that are challenging the norms of the global system, uh, and there's more than one of those. I don't, we, we can talk about that perhaps later. It's a, a world marked by regional crises. It's a world that is increasingly uh, less transparent, more unpredictable, and in many respects more dangerous and more difficult to read than the world of the, uh, of the Cold War. For all the violence of those proxy wars of the Cold War era, this is a world that is much more complex and much more difficult to read, and it's getting more complex by the day. And there too, I think, you know, 1914 feels much, it's a paradox, of course, that even as it slips further back into the historical past, 1914 seems to speak to us more intimately than it did uh, in, a, in a prior era. And these perspectival shifts challenge us to rethink the story of how war came to Europe. And adopt it, accepting this challenge doesn't mean adopting a kind of vulgar presentism where you remake the past to, to suit the, the priorities of the present. That, but that's really not, if, if that were what we were about, then we could forget the whole thing. Um, it means profiting from our changed vantage point to see aspects of the past which, in the, which, which previously were sort of airbrushed <coughs> from the scene or which previously we failed to atten pay attention to. And in, this, in the time left to us, and I don't want to take too much of your time with the formal bit of this meeting, um, I'd like to, direct, to, to, to dwell briefly on some of the aspects of the etiology of this war, some of the aspects of its causation that particularly caught my attention and that are pati uh, uh, perhaps are particularly handy for thinking about links between then and now. 
before going on to, to, to dwell briefly on their relevance to current developments. Okay, so first of all, there's the fact that when we think of, you know, we, it, it might be handy to think of 1914 as an international crisis, but when you use the word international, um, a kind of picture forms in one's mind, which is a little bit like the cartoons, the caricatures of the pre-war world, where you see a bunch of characters, each one of which represents a, a, a state. So it's Marianne, if it's France, often a, an attractive young woman. Then it's um, the Kaiser with his bristling and erect moustaches. That's Willem, he's Germany. And um, then there's the, the, the Tsar in the case of Russia and George V for England and so on. And the, the assumption that's built into these images is that states are compact, discrete entities which, can, which have a single and unified will. But in fact, the world of 1914 wasn't remotely like this. The executives that produced policy in 1914 were anything but unified. And power was constantly flowing around inside them, moving from one node in the system to another. So for example, if you'd asked a very well-informed observer in St. Petersburg, who runs the show? Who makes foreign policy in Russia? The answer in January 1904 would have been the Tsar. Um, but after the Russo-Japanese War, which is in large part a consequence of the policies of the Tsar himself, if you'd asked the same question again in 1906, the answer would be, now the Tsar has really disappeared from politics. He's sort of licking his wounds after the war against Japan, which of course the Russians lost. Now it's Pyotr Stalipin, the, 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 the prime minister effectively, the president of the Council of Ministers. If you'd asked the question a few, a few years later during the Bosnian annexation crisis, the answer would be it's the, it's the foreign minister. He's now running the show. A few years later, you'd say it's Stalipin again. Then Stalipin's assassinated. Then the answer would be we don't really know who's running the show. The ambassadors are all making it up as they go uh, and so on. This was Russia before 1914, but the, the picture elsewhere was virtually the same. In France, just to give you one example, during the tenure in office of the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, 16 French foreign ministers came and went from office, and two of them came and went twice. That's really quite an achievement. Um, <coughs> so, and even in Britain, where you had a, a structurally very secure and powerful foreign uh, minister in the form of Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey, even there, Gray cannot speak clearly his intentions in foreign policy because he has to deal with a majority with his, within his own cabinet that does not support his view of British foreign interests, in particular his commitment to the Entente with France and by extension to the, to the oblique relationship with St. Petersburg, with Russia. So in other words, um, this is a situation where um, the crisis proneness of the system is greatly enhanced by confusion about how, how policy is being made and what direction it's going to take next. Unpredictability is built into this system at every level. So that's one point I think that might be worth thinking about uh, from the point of view of looking for analogies or not with contemporary developments. Then there's the fact that, and this is um, something that really struck me while I was writing the book, because when I got to, 19, uh, to, to um, the point where I was writing about the Italian attack on Libya in 1911. Now this is a really important war. Without any provocation, the Italians attacked the three vilayets, the three provinces of the Ottoman Empire, today known as Libya um, in northern Africa. And um, this war was important because it flashed a green light to the Balkan states. It said, it's time for a free-for-all uh, at the expense of the Ottoman Empire. Everyone take what they can. Uh, it, was the, it really was the, the, the war that started the two wars in the Balkans. And in fact, the Serbian... Uh, the head of the Serbian political department of the Serbian foreign ministry, a man called Spalajkovic, after the First World War, commented to a French um, journalist. He said, this war against Libya in 1911, which everybody's forgotten today, he was saying this in 1921, this war 10 years ago in 1911 was actually, that was, c'était la première agression, that was the first aggression. It started the two wars in the Balkans, and out of that came the Great War. So th this is the, uh, one of the best informed Serbian statesmen commenting on the relationship between this war and, these, and, and, the, and, the, the, and the, the war that subsequently came. And what was interesting about that was I was just writing about this war in 2011, when suddenly the very names, the very place names that I was writing about, Misrata, Zawiya, you know, and so on, were all in the headlines once again, because once again, exactly 100 years later, there were airstrikes on Libya. And in fact, this war of 1911 had been the first war in which airstrikes were used. This is the first time that bombs were thrown from planes. It wasn't very impressive technologically. They were hand thrown. They had to be primed by hand where well, they were gripped between the knees of the pilot. Um, but nevertheless, you had dirigible balloons which could throw 250 bombs from racks um, for the, uh, uh, built into the, to the, um, to the, to the galleys for, the, for that purpose. 
And so, you know, I almost, there was almost a sort of out-of-body experience as I found myself wondering whether by writing these words I was making these events happen in the present. <laughs> now, I, I assure you, this, this delusion only lasted for a few nanoseconds, and I quickly recovered. But the point is that um, this was at one of those moments when history, in an almost sort of spooky way, was rhyming. Uh, it wasn't repeating itself, but as Mark Twain said, you know, although it doesn't repeat itself, it does rhyme. And this was certainly a very pronounced moment of rhyming. Uh, and one which one might reflect on, because of course we know that just as the Libyan war was a, a way station towards 1914, so it's been claimed that the experience of Libyan intervention by the Western powers what played an important role um, in putting in place the narrative that's now currently motivating Vladimir Putin's um, policy on, on the Ukraine. Um, he's, he was very vehement in his protests at what uh, at, the, at the way in which the Libyan situation, as he saw it, got out of control um, and sort of lurched, drifted in the direction of regime change. And um, it's, it's widely believed that, um, and certainly has been claimed by some associates of Putin, that Libya was an important episode in forming his uh, current view of policy and of events. Finally, there's one last point I want to draw your attention to, and that is uh, something about something that changed in the international system in the last years before 1914, and it has to do with the nature of the alliance established between Russia and France in 1892. In 1892, Russia and France formed an alliance. Um, it was basically an alliance from France's point of view. It was an alliance designed to, um, designed to ensure that in, if, the, if, Fran if Germany waged war on either France or Russia, um, both states would mobilize in tandem and attack Ru and Germany on two fronts and place, Russia under, uh, place Germany under the threat of a war on, uh, in the East and the West simultaneously. That was its purpose. But throughout the um, 1890s and into the 1900s, the French and the Russians constantly warned each other not to overuse this alliance. So what they meant by that was the Russians said to the French, don't count on us for some kind of adventure in Morocco. If you go into Morocco and, you know, uh, and make the Germans annoyed and expect us to pull your chestnuts out of the fire over northern Africa, forget it. We're not interested in northern Africa. And the French said to the Russians, if you think we're going to back you over adventures in the Balkans, forget it. We're not. We're, France does not recognize in the Balkans a vital interest for Russia or for France. But this changed in the last... 18, 24 months before the outbreak of the First World War. At the end of 1911, in particular during the Balkan Wars themselves, 1912 and 1913, the French leadership, and particularly Raymond Poincaré, but also many other members of the French military, started assuring the Russians. They started saying, look, we, we, we see the importance of the Balkans for Russia now, and we wish to make it known to you that if you feel at some point, as a result of a, of a conflict in the Balkans that breaks up between Austria and a Balkan state, most probably Serbia, we w want you to understand that France will stand by you. So in other words, the alliance changed in character. And by, by, as a consequence of that, Serbia began to become, uh, not by any uh, wish of Serbia itself, this is not by Serbia's own doing, but Serbia became, be became more and more an instrument, a salient, a security salient for the uh, Entente powers, for Russia and France in particular, as they bought into the future scenario of a war of Balkan inception, a war that would begin in the Balkans. Nobody really minded who, would, who was going to start this war. It might be the Serbs, it might be the Austrians, who knew? But the point was there would be a, a war in the Balkans, uh, not a war which directly threatened Russia, but the, the, the alliance would respond nonetheless and would become, it would view this conflict as a casus belli, as a casus fideris, as a trigger for the alliance. Okay, so that was obviously a very important development for, um, for in the pre-war system, which made the, uh, the, the events of 1914 possible. I don't want to stop there uh, virtually and just close now with a few thoughts on analogies between now and then. The question we have to ask ourselves is how deep does, the, does any kind of analogy you want to draw really go? The specter of 1914, of course, is useful, uh, and it, gets, it, it becomes, it, it's present in our minds whenever uncertainty grows because it's a reminder of how terrible the costs can be when politics fails, when conversation stops, when compromise becomes impossible. So in that sense, it's, it's understandably present in our thoughts and our discourses um, at the moment, and not just because of the anniversary. But in fact, the alignments implicated in the Ukrainian emergency that we're looking at now bear little relation to the geopolitical constellations of 1914. At that time, two central powers faced a trio of world empires on Europe's eastern and western peripheries. Today, a broad coalition of Western and Central European states is united in protesting Russia's interventions in the Ukraine, though not at all united on what the policy implications of that might be. And the restless, ambitious German Kaiserreich of 1914 scarcely resembles the EU, 
a sort of you know, multi-state conglomerate focused on economic integration and the rule of law that finds it incredibly difficult to project power or to formulate a unified external policy. In some ways, the Crimean War of 1853 to 6 might offer a better fit. Here, at least, we can speak of a coalition of Western states united in opposition to Russian imperial ventures. This conflict, which ultimately consumed well over half a million lives, so it was not a trivial war, escalated when Russia sent 80,000 troops into the Ottoman-controlled Danubian principalities of Moldova and Wallachia. Russia argued that it had the right and obligation to act as the guardian of Orthodox Christians within the Ottoman Empire, much as it today claims the right to, sa to safeguard the interests of ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine. But here, too, it would be a, you know, a, a, a mistake to push the analogy too far. In the 1850s, the Western powers feared that Russian predations against the Ottomans would destabilize the entire zone from the Middle East to Central Asia, undermining the security of the British and French world empires. Since neither the Ottoman Empire nor its English or French counterparts exist today, the mechanisms of trans-imperial destabilization are absent in the current crisis. We're not looking at that kind of global vulnerability. Um, <coughs> the current crisis rather involves the relationship between Russia and one relatively isolated former client state on its periphery, or former peripheral federal member state on its periphery. Pushing back further into the past, we can discern more distant precedents, which further complicate the picture, namely the Russian annexation of the eastern half of the Ukraine up to 1654. It's important to remember that this relationship is older than the union between England and Scotland, um, and the, the, um, the, the penetration of, of the Russians into, or, or of, of Muscovy uh, into Cossackdom, into the Cossack areas, and eventually the push so south into the Crimea from the reign of Peter the Great onwards. So this is a very old story. It's the long, slow story of Russian territorial expansion, a process lasting centuries in which Muscovy acquired, on average, P um, P uh, Richard Pipes made this calculation, acquired on average every year an area equivalent in size to modern Holland. So that was the ra rate of expansion, one Holland per year. But what none of these historical genealogies captures, of course, is the unruly dynamic, and that's in a way what started the whole current um, situation, is the unruly dynamic of revolution and civil strife in the Ukraine itself, a phenomenon that evokes very different precedents. And following the news last month, it was difficult, for historians at least, not to think of the many parallels with the English Civil War. There, too, you had a parliament in, uh, locked in a standoff with an increasingly controversial uh, head of state. It was not the office of the king or of the president in the Ukraine case uh, that, whose legitimacy was in question, but the behavior of the individuals occupying these offices, and the conduct of the persons. And just as President Yanukovych fled from, from uh, the capital to an undisclosed Croatian, uh, uh, location after the breakdown of order in Kiev, so Charles I, having tried and failed to arrest the ringleaders of the parliamentary opposition in London, left the capital only to return seven years later for his arrest and execution, trial and execution. And in both cases, news of a provincial uprising uh, in support of the beleaguered sovereign, Irish Catholics in the case of Charles I, and Ukrainian Russians for Yanukovych in the Ukrainian case, trigger, triggered a decisive escalation. The difficulty of the current crisis, it seems to me, lies precisely in the folding together of these very different narratives, these very disparate narratives, civil upheaval, geopolitical tension, and imperial expansion. The arrangements put in place since the collapse of the Soviet Union have added a further layer of complexity. The EU has invested deeply in the process of democratization in the Ukraine. That's the kind of thing the EU does for the best possible motives. The partnership and cooperation agreement signed in 1998 exists to sustain political and economic transformation within the partner state. And ratification, as I'm sure you all know, of, the, of a new association agreement negotiated in 2007 to 11, was made conditional upon the implementation of key domestic reform targets. So the EU intervened very deeply in the domestic affairs of the Ukraine. By contrast, NATO, as the alliance formed to protect Western interests in the Cold War, is focused firmly on the global balance of power just as the Crimean coalition was in the, 19, in the 1850s. NATO and the EU are not, of course, coextensive. Um, who am I saying that to? And they're not identical in their interests. When the Americans, the Poles, and the Baltics, Baltic states proposed the extension of NATO membership to Georgia and Ukraine in 2008, 
France and Germany objected, just as Prussia refused to join the anti-Russian Crimean coalition of 1854-5, uh, much to the indignation of the French and the British. Lastly, there's the complex political demography of Ukraine, itself the legacy of centuries of Russian penetration and settlement. The deep ethnic divisions in the country and the special constitutional and military status of the peninsula make no sense without this history. And so I want to come to a close now. That's why I think that any solution uh, to this problem has to take into account the very different imperatives implied by these narratives. And I think it's an awareness of this dimension of complexity that accounts in part for the irresolute or hesitant response of the Western powers to the recent seizure of the peninsula and to the events that have followed. Using the Ukraine as a proxy to box, box the Russians in would be insensitive to the, period of the, to the history of the region and would merely lead to further instability. On the other hand, letting the Russians do whatever they want will merely invite Moscow to continue using the Ukraine as a proxy for pushing the West back. Betting the farm on the Ukrainian revolution, as the EU did, is risky, given the unpredictability of all such tumults. What's needed is a composite uh, solution that takes account of all the interests, each with its own historical hinterland engaged with the conflict. So I come to the closing question. Are we in danger of blundering into a major conflagration in the, in the manner of 1914? I don't think so. It seems to me that the executives engaged, the executives of the states engaged in this um, emergency today or responding to it are far more streamlined, far more transparent, and far clearer about their intentions than their predecessors in 1914. There exists today no counterpart for the kind of Balkan inception scenario that fueled escalation in 1914, where states bought in to the affairs of a very, um, of an unstable uh, area with, without considering the possible consequences. The language of the EU foreign ministers and of the Washington administration has been marked on the whole by caution and circumspection, too much circumspection for um, some people's tastes. The responses of Western leaders to the provocations offered by Mr. Putin have displayed a level of self-critical reflection. I'm thinking here of Stein, Mr. Steinmeier, the German foreign minister's comments on um, EU foreign policy and German foreign policy um, that really have no cannot be compared with the behavior of his 20th century, of his early 20th century counterparts. If anything, the danger in this case may be the converse, namely that in striving to avoid an escalation and possibly also to avoid the discomforts associated with a strong sanctions regime, especially when sensitive energy political issues are, are involved, Western leaders risk failing to send the kind of clear signals that are required to make it clear to Mr. Putin that there are limits to their indulgence. Perhaps most importantly, something else is absent in the current constellation, this is where I'll stop, that was absolutely decisive in 1914. At that time, the fragile equilibrium between the two European alliance blocs encouraged both sides, both on the one hand, to contemplate with relative equanimity the risk of a major conflict, because both sides thought they could prevail um, and get away, as it were, without suffering the consequences of the conflict uh, or too, too greatly suffering them. And secondly, this equilibrium encouraged both to fear, to fear that the failure to take action sooner rather than later might result in the condition of permanent inferiority. This is one of the amazing things about 1914, that on both sides we find paranoia and fear that if one doesn't act soon, one will drift into permanent inferiority vis-a-vis -vis the other side. Today, the situation is quite different. There is no equilibrium. Um, we're not working against the, clocks, as, uh, against the clock, as so many of the decision makers of 1914 felt they were. There is time to, to think about what needs to be done. And this is not an argument for complacency, because I do think that recent events in the Ukraine have revealed many weaknesses in the crisis management of the Western powers. But it is, on the other hand, an argument for calm, considered, determined, and unified action. Thank you. Professor Clark, thank you. My gosh, wasn't that a rich historical walk um, and a jog or near jog, the end? A, yeah. a, a sprint. A jog. Sprint, sprint. sorry. <laughs> exactly. Thank I know you. people in Washington are busy. I didn't want to take up too no, much time. No, no, no. That was perfect. And you leave us hungry for more in, in a good discussion. Um, I'm going to make a confession. I'm halfway through the book. I'm not the entire way through, but I love it. And it, uh, it's dense and it's rich but it 
you, you, you get immersed in it, and uh, it, it's, it's required reading. I know many in our audience have read it. What I'd like to do is read you a quick quote. This is actually a New York Times uh, review of the book by uh, Harold Evans, who's the editor-at-large at Reuters. And, and I want to pull some on, <coughs> so let me, let me quickly read. The brilliance of Clark's far-reaching history is that we are able to discern how the past was genuinely prologue. The participants were coordinated to keep walking along a precipitous escarpment, sure of their own moral compass, but unknowingly impelled by a complex interaction of deep-rooted cultures, patriotism and paranoia, sentiments of history, folk memory, ambition, and intrigue. They were, in Clark's terms, sleepwalk sleepwalkers, watchful but unseen, haunted by dreams, yet blind to the reality of the horror that they were about to bring into the world. As I've read the book, Quite frankly, I'm not sure they were sleepwalking. Mm. They had their purpose, misperceptions, the historical issues, the perceptions of others. It, it seemed to me that they were just, they had blinders on rather than sleepwalking. Yeah. And, yes. and, and that was, a, and some, some reviewers have critiqued the book and saying they weren't sleepwalking. They just, in some perspectives, were, were unaware uh, of, of yes. the consequences of what they were doing. Is that a fair? I think, that, I think that is a fair challenge. I mean, uh, the sleepwalking is, the sleepwalker metaphor is just a metaphor. So if it were 100% <laughs> applicable, it would be a description. <laughs> so uh, it only works in part. And what I wanted to evoke with the, with the picture of the sleepwalker is the, the thing that I think is most uncanny about a sleepwalker, which is that sleepwalkers can form a purpose. They can conceive of a purpose. They may not be fully conscious. That's to say, not all their mind is conscious, but they can, I, I mean, I met this journalist who, um, told me that every night he goes, he gets out of bed and, and packs the, the bags to go on holiday. But there are no bags and he's just putting you know, stuff from the night table on the floor. And after a while his, <laughs> he, his girlfriend wakes up and says, you know, come back to bed, you're, you're, you're this, you wake up and get, you're, you're, this is silly. So he goes back to bed. This happens almost every night. So um, he's, he, he, he is able to think holidays. This is someone who obviously doesn't enjoy his job. <laughs> but he, he's able to think, you know, I'm going on holidays, I'm packing my bags and so on. It's just that he's not aware that there aren't any bags. So, it's that it's the limited quality of that consciousness. That's what I wanted to capture, and the the interact the the, the 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 juxtaposition on the one hand of purposive, purpose-directed, goal-oriented behavior, which by people who are you know well-educated and clever and have a lot of information to hand and are, and are calculating risks and so on, um, with more or less stringency depending on where we where we are, but um, but who seem you know frustratingly unaware of the larger frame in which they're operating. I mean, part of the problem is simply the problem of complexity that. If, if, if a system is complex, then the outcomes of the system uh, can't, cannot be reduced to the, the actions of any one participant in the, in the system. And that, that was one of the problems, that they, that they lacked a kind of sense of the, um, of the relationship between in individual and systemic outcomes. And you know, that's still, I think, a problem for politics today. But um, it was certainly a very, d very, very you know, marked problem of, of 1914. And that's what I wanted to capture with sleepwalkers. The, the question of nationalism, uh, and of course, in the first portion of the book, we spend an enormous amount of time looking at Serbian nationalism and uh, its rise. And as I look, and, and we're obviously focusing on the upcoming European Parliament elections, where you have uh, an expression of, of growing nationalism, uh, some would even argue xenophobia rising mm. in <coughs> Europe. The role of nationalism as it played in the conflict in 1914, and then fast forwarding to mm. its complexity in today's Europe. <coughs> yes, because you mentioned Serbian nationalism, can I make, I'd like to make one thing clear, because I've of often been misunderstood on this point. You know, I'm not blaming the Serbs for the outbreak of this war. And I, you know, Serbia had, was, the Serbian leadership was operating under extreme pressure from many different directions and was in a very unenviable position. So I don't, certainly don't want to demonize the Serbs or their leadership. Um, I think that, um, but you're absolutely right, nationalism is a very important part of this. I think today nationalism is playing a different role. Um, you know, the problem with nation for nationalism with the EU is that it's a, it's a, it's a, dissolvi it's a uh, dissolving force. It's a force which is dissolving the unity, threatens to dissolve the unity of the, of the Union. And um, it's deeply interlocked with anti-unionist uh, movements. So Alternativa for Deutschland, you know, um, the, the Front National in, in France, well, the name says it all. Um, they kind of drift into an increasingly nationalist rhetoric of the Hungarian um, political culture. Um, these are, in my view, 
profoundly regrettable um, developments. And they do undermine the cohesion. Of, there's no question they undermine the cohesion of the EU as a, as a shared political culture. Uh, and they raise questions about the future of the EU um, over the next 10 or 20 years. Though I must say, I, I, well, I really hope that the EU survives these, these um, pains and ills that it's going through at the moment. The, the, the only reason for hope, I think, is that these, it's, it's no accident that these um, movements are so strong at a moment of economic um, dislocation. And so it's to be hoped that as the, you know, if and when, when um, the EU emerges into full-scale recovery from the financial crisis uh, and the crisis of the Eurozone, that um, these movements will lose a lot of, the, a lot of their oxygen and will start to, to, to sort of wither away again. But um, nevertheless, so nationalism is in play in that sense, and it's, uh, it's weakening the, the sort of resolve of the EU. It creates a less unified uh, bloc. It, um, it undermines the legitimacy of the EU's appeal as a, uh, to some extent as a sort of social and political model. If, if, the, if the confidence in that model is uh, you know, visibly d dwindling within the EU itself, um, and so on. So these are all bad things, which um, lessen the weight of Europe in international affairs. Um, I must say, I, I would be interested to hear what people in this room think about the place of nationalism in, in Vladimir Putin's politic, politics. Um, presumably, it's a factor there, um, but it, how exactly it plays um, into, into his actions over the last couple of months, I'm, I'm not really um, you know, qualified to say. Oh, yes, sorry, perfect. of course. No, thank yeah. you. Always help us with our mics, absolutely. Thank yes, you. yes, yes, good point. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, one, um, w you talked about the power of the personalities uh, mm. throughout, uh, uh, throughout the book, and you mentioned a sort of this crisis of masculinity. Mm. And I just wanted to draw you out, because that's also been uh, part of the conversation around the book. Help us understand uh, in the context of, of your writings what yes. you perceive as the crisis of masculinity. Well, I, I, was, I remember once um, being sort of stopped by a, 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 co a very wonderful female colleague um, who said to me, are there any, any women in your book? And I sort of suddenly thought, and there was a kind of moment of panic. You know, I could feel <laughs> the blood draining from my face. And I thought, uh, no, there aren't. Um, it's true, it's all about men. And then I thought, well, I, I, I better think a bit about that, what it means that these people, these characters are all men. Um, now, by, stress, by, by stressing masculinity, I don't mean, you know, th there used to be a British comedy series called Men Behaving Badly, which would be quite a good title for the, um, for the sort of prequel to 1914. But, um, <laughs> but you know, the thing is that um, I, I didn't really mean by masculinity just that, you know, men, uh, that's the way men are, but, you know, men are like that. They, they're sort of, you know, uh, you know macho and, and um, bullying and aggressive and so on. What I meant really was that masculinity was taking forms in the early 20th century, which were different from the forms uh, of masculinity taken, for example, in the, by a previous generation of statesmen. If you compare the statesmen of the, of the generation, the cohort of 1900 to 1914, you find their language is saturated with references to their own manliness, right? So it's, you know, Bateman says, if to back down over, over, over the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the provocation to Vienna by Serbia would be an act of self-castration. I mean, he, he, those are his words, selbst entmannung, right? Um, Self-unmanning. Um, you know, um, Viscount Barty the, of Tame, the, the foreign, uh, Britain's ambassador in Paris, says these Germans are trying to push us into the water and steal our clothes. Now, this is a picture that comes from bo a teenage boyhood at Eton College, where he went to school, where, you know, you'd go swimming in the pond and then some nasty village boy would come and nick your, your stuff, so that you'd have to go back to school with no clothes. Very embarrassing. Um, you know, it's, it's a very masculine world. You have a lot of talk of being hard. De la fermeté is, is Poincaré's gospel. Firmness, we must stay hard. Il faut tenir le coup, we have to hold through to the bitter end. There's a language of unyielding hardness, not conceding an inch of territory, which is quite different from the language of the cohort of the statesmen of the era of Bismarck, Cavour, you know, Salisbury, and so on. In that era, what, what the statesmen wanted to do was be smarter than the opponent, outsmart the enemy. Um, it was a kind of a, a politics of maneuver. Whereas in 1914, what we see is a language of unyielding determination, which I think did, in a way, sort of down, you know, it, it, it doesn't exactly prescribe options. It doesn't, you know, ma make one policy happen rather than another. But what it does is it diminishes the, the, the sort of the, the moral weight of options which are about flexibility, suppleness, you know, uh, and so on, and increases the moral weight of, uh, of hawkish, hardline policies. 
And so it was that that I was trying to draw attention to. And of course, that is still a contemporary uh, thing. There has been a kind of revival of a certain form of raw, feral masculinity in, in European um, political culture, I think. Mr. Putin think is a symbol of that Mr. many times. Well, Mr. Putin riding, riding around with no shirt on a horse and um, shooting a tiger, ad admittedly only with a tranquilizer dart, but nonetheless, um, a tiger all the same, and then being photographed with it. Uh, and so on, these are signs of, and um, Berlusconi is another example. It is, I mean, Putin is not alone. Um, there's a sort of new and rather, um, how do one put it, rather rancid manliness on show. Um, and, you know, that, that, that you know, there, there, there may be a cultural turn going on in that area as well. So I think there, it, it was important in 1914, but it's not about masculinity as a, as a sort of trans-historical essence, but about styles of male behavior in politics, mm -hmm. which, which are historically specific and time bound. Did you think one of the, there, there was this assumption by all, like the two Balkans wars, that this would be short, this would be, the, the, the conflict in 1914 mm. would be short, we'd, we'd be home by Christmas, <coughs> that they really, that they did not understand the calamity because they honestly thought this would be short. How much did that play into the psyche yeah. of all the leaders as they looked at these two equal powers uh, fighting each other? Well, this is one of the oddest problems of 1914, one of the hardest to unravel is that because we know that actually, you know, there's plenty of expert commentary on the meaning of a, a mass war. Everybody understood what the interaction between the, the sort of the tactics of mass infantry shock, which was still the, the which was still the predominant doctrine, um, the interaction between masses of infantrymen <coughs> and the high-tech weaponry available in 1914 with stationary machine guns, but also even more importantly with fast firing artillery. Artillery was really the area where the, the technological change had been very, very swift. And um, some of these, you know, the, the French fast firing artillery pieces could fire more rounds than, um, than, a, than a bolt action rifle uh, per minute. So, the, the, you know, and people had done the math and they'd realized, well, if you put this kind of firepower into masses of men, you will have casualty lists that will be so long that, that no newspaper will be able to print them all, right? There, 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 there will be, it will be an unforeseen carnage, and there are even novels which predict this. There's an extraordinary novel by a German social democratic teacher called Das Menschenschlachthaus, The Human Slaughterhouse, which is about, which describes with uncanny accuracy, and this is in 1912, um, that the, the, the sort of moonscapes of um, the Somme and so on. So there are, both, there's both expert commentary and sort of literary fiction, which is imagining the way uh, in this new world, is, this new war is going to pan out. Uh, should it be allowed to happen. On the other hand, there's a bizarre continu uh, continuing belief mm -hmm. that one can somehow circumvent this carnage by just investing enough in the assault, in the, in the offensive. If you take the enemy's positions fast enough and with enough men. And so when observers saw, for example, in the Russo-Japanese War, saw Japanese infantrymen piling up in front of um, Russian machine gun nests at, around Port Arthur, they concluded that the the Japanese were not pressing the attack hard enough. Mm -hmm. They must put more men uh, into harm's way rather than, um, rather than sort of, you know, as it were, changing their approach to the, to the assault entirely. So in other words, there's a kind of sense in which the fear that the war will really be, um, you know, an endless carnage. And on the other hand, the hope that one will circumvent this outcome through swift um, action and determined action, uh, they held each other in balance uh, in a way that, as we now know, was very dangerous. Uh, it's not that people believed there would be, I mean, there was talk of getting home by Christmas and there was hope that that might be possible. But, you know, we also find many of the military leaders, Moltke, for example, oscillating between extreme confidence and nervous breakdown like collapses of confidence where he thinks, you know, it's not going to work, it's all going to collapse and so on. They see, they, they, there are moments when they see the future quite clearly. Um, so it's not, it's not, as people used to talk about, the illusion of the short war. Um, being a crucial factor in the outbreak of, of war in 1914. It's there, but it doesn't have that kind of absolute traction. It's more about a mix of fear mm. and hope. Mm. My final question before uh, I, I open this conversation up to the audience. Um, you know, there's, there's been a bit of political sensitivity about how to commemorate this conflict, certainly in, 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 in Britain, but as well as in, in Germany. How does history reflect on this? And as you're watching this uh, debate, mm. uh, wh what has struck you about how, uh, how the governments themselves are planning to commemorate this? This is an enormous role yeah. in, well, again, historical narratives do play an enormous, war, uh, nor enormous uh, role in our, our own exceptionalism as a country. 
What your reflections on this, both from the <coughs> British <coughs> side, but also from the German side? Well, I think that the, the most, for me, the most surprising and striking um, insight that's been generated by the, by the, the various memorial um, programs that have unfolded in the different states has been the, 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 distant, the degree to which Europe remains incapable of remembering this European war in a European way. So um, the war is still being remembered almost entirely through a nation state frame. Um, and you know, in Britain, there's been a, a, a surprising revival of a yes. kind of jingoistic yes. language. You know, this was a just war. You've had, uh, it's become quite common to claim that the First and the Second World Wars were no different in their moral dimension, which I think is an extraordinary claim, but it's made in one very, um, in one best-selling book on Britain's on the war in, the, in 1914 by Max Hastings. I, you know, that's one sort of direction things have taken. You know, members of the government, um, Michael Gove, the, bar the, the, the Secretary for Education, um, you know, very intelligent and well-read man, but he's intervened in the debate saying that, you know, Britain should be proud of its role in the First World War. It was war, a just war, a war fought for good ends, to defeat tyranny in the name of democracy and so on. Boris Johnson, the quirky and popular mayor of London, has weighed in along much the same lines. Um, the Kaiserreich, the German imp Empire, has been described as fascist. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of sort of mixing around and um, re, re, re sort of rehabilitating this war as a, um, a war fought for e the, the every right possible reason. Now, um, things are different elsewhere. In, in France, there is not this kind of triumphalism, not at all. France has always remembered this war as a trauma, uh, among other things, as a profound demographic um, you know, injury to the, to the nation uh, with it, m the massive mortalities involved. Um, it's not a it's not a chauvinist mood at all. It's a mood of you know um, reflection and meditation, and um, not exactly mourning. It's too distant for that. But a sort of serious reflection on what this immense toll in lives means for the present. Um, in Germany, it's been dominated by the question of um, you know whether the Germans are should still regard themselves as primarily culpable, um, but uh, also by a, si a similar kind of mood to the to the French one. In fact, really. The, Fr the Germans also regard this. The, 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 well, the odd thing about the German memory of the First World War is that it was widely believed the Germans didn't remember this war, mm. that the, the First World War had been buried by the trauma of the Second. The Second is such an, you know, the trauma of both of the, of, of the, the acknowledgement of German criminality and in the Second World War and genocide on the one hand, and also the just extraordinary physical effects of the war on, the German, on, on Germany as a place, um, had sort of buried the memory of this more distant conflict. But what turns out to be the case, and this has been the mo one of the most interesting developments, I think, is that there's a lot of privately archived memory of the First World War in the German population. Everybody has grandparents uh, whose letters survive, whose diaries survive. Everyone has stories about the First World War. They just didn't ever, until now, correspond to the public culture of memory. And now the connection has been started to be forged, and the war is uh, being articulated. <laughs> Memories of the war are being articulated in a new way on a new public plane. So it's all been very, very interesting. But I think it's you know depressing that Europe um, that there that the memory is so un-European, mm. and um, there hasn't been any c cooperation between the French and the Germans. It's not the French fault. The French wanted to collaborate with Berlin, but Berlin announced in 1913 and 2013 they said we don't have any plans, so you'll have to do this do this on your own. You know we just uh, you know and so on. So uh, you know what even joint ventures that could have worked haven't really come to pass, and I think that is a pity and tells us something about you know the continuing weakness of European identity. Um, it's interesting that in Brussels, they, 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 wa they want to open a, a, a museum of European history, a museum of European places of memory. But the problem they have is they can't think of what to put in the museum. And that is extraordinary. I mean, um, it's not like Europe is, has an under, is undersupplied with history. <laughs> Indeed. In Thank you so much. Please, uh, colleagues, if you could raise your hand um, and uh, your offer your name and uh, your affiliation. We have microphones. Just give us a second to get to you. David, uh, Ignatius, I'll start with you. Louis Simon, please. Uh, David Ignatius, a uh, journalist from the Washington Post. Uh, fascinating, wonderful lecture. Uh, I want to ask you to um, think with us about the counterfactual. About, uh, the, about counterfactual. the counterfactual. That is to say, um, suppose uh, Franz Ferdinand hadn't been uh, assassinated. Suppose uh, this sleepwalking Europe of, uh, of the summer of 1914 hadn't had that um, uh, catastrophic event that then set things in motion. Mm. What was the system um, underlying uh, uh, s 
stable and, and, and capable of continuity, or was it mm -hmm. headed for some other uh, catastrophe? And then if you would think uh, similarly about, about the current situation with um, Putin's Russia, uh, and whether uh, had there not been the Euromaidan protest suddenly changing the, the <coughs> role in, in the in-betweenness of Ukraine, mm -hmm. was there something else um, that was gonna happen uh, that Putin would have seized on mm. uh, in what was uh, a, a much less uh, stable situation than it, that it may have appeared. Thank you very much for that very interesting question. Um, just staying with 1914 to start with, um, you remind me of a, of a headline, a joke headline in the San Fran I think it was the San Francisco Chronicle from sometime in the early 1920s, which went like this, um, Archduke found alive, World War a mistake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, um, I, I think it is that actually true, odd as it may seem, that if, that if Franz Ferdinand had, had survived that visit to Sarajevo and got back home, we know several things. We can unfold the counterfactual. You know, the first few steps we are on fairly solid ground because we know that Franz Fer Ferdinand was, first of all, had pleaded for peace at every opportunity and had always argued against any kind of adventurism, especially in the Balkans. Secondly, we know that he was planning, after the Bosnian summer maneuvers, to sack Konrad von Hutzendorf, the most hawkish figure in the leadership, the, the chief of the general staff, who was very keen on a war with Serbia. He was going to be sacked because um, Franz Ferdinand had just had enough of him. Um, and so th that relationship would probably have continued to improve, which, which, it, which it was actually in the spring of 1914, oddly enough. Relations between Serbia and Vienna were just beginning to show there were you know, the first signs that they could collaborate as neighbors. I won't go into the details, but various things have been done in collaboration, which, which you know, augured, <coughs> augured for, for a, you know, a better future. Um, what would have happened then? Well, you know, the, 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 the key point I'd make is that the system was actually much more openly texted than it appears in retrospect. And just to give you one example, um, in the summer of 1914, the London leadership is pondering dropping altogether the relationship with Russia because they're tired of, they had this convention signed with Russia in 1907, and it was basically a power sharing agreement to keep the Russians out of Northern India, away from Northern India, by dividing Central Asia in half and saying you can have the North, we've got the South. And the Russians had so frequently and repeatedly breached the terms of this agreement that the British were planning to break, to drop the agreement, not to renew it, uh, and to seek instead an understanding with Berlin. So um, the personal secretary of Sir Edward Grey was briefed for this mission in the summer of 1914. Then came the assassinations, the July crisis, and the World War. So that tells us something about other futures that were never realized, but w with which this era was pregnant. I mean, the thing is that you know the, the w w w it's very hard to um, it's very hard to take seriously the fact that the past was as open as the present. You know, um, it's only one future was of any given past is ever realized because we don't have, we're not living in parallel universes. But um, every past has, you know, different futures in it, the seeds of many different futures in it, just as ours does. And so coming then back to, to the story about, to the, to the question of how that question might relate to the recent events in the Ukraine. Um, yes, I mean, I don't really think the Ukraine is a complete bolt out of the blue, is it? I mean, if you think about the Georgian um, events of 2008, uh, Ossetia, and so on, there, clearly there is something going on about, uh, there, there is an instability about the former Soviet periphery, which, um, and, we, and what we really need to, est to, est to establish in the longer term is some kind of set of agreed protocols about how that area should be managed, and uh, through a process of communication with Russia. Um, it's clearly not a, dis a debate which Russia can be excluded from, um, on the other hand, it's not an area in which Russia can be allowed to dictate um, one-sidedly, unilaterally dictate outcomes. So some kind of, um, some kind of con you know, composite solution will have to be found, found for that entire peripheral area, um, which is uh, where, where there are lots of spots with the, with the potential for instability. So in that sense, I suppose, you know, um, the Ukraine looks like a further iteration of the, of the set of issues raised um, in Georgia. Of course, there are lots of differences as well. Um, there, there was actually an attack on, on Russian outposts in the, at the time of Saakashvili and his, his, ti his tenure in office in Georgia. There's no analog for that. Instead, we have, as you say, civil unrest creating um, you know, un unforeseen constellations in the country itself. But nevertheless, the, you can see a link there in, in terms of the geopolitical specificity of that area. Wonderful. Thank you. 
My name is Richard Ranger. I work for the American Petroleum Institute, but really I'm here as a tourist who's become a student of World War I. Uh, and like many Americans starting out behind because what we remember is high school history where we were taught Wilson won it, and, and then we move on to the uh, Roaring Twenties. Um, my question, back to your last statement where you were concluding the dialogue about this odd new approach to the war, kind of going nationalist again almost in terms of uh, taking sides. And I, and I wonder if, having read Paul Fussell among one, is, mm. is that possibly the response, I hate to use the word elites, but we'll say leaderships, the, 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 the response of elites yes. starting to overcome <coughs> what had been the shared memory of the soldiers and the sufferers, the poilus, mm -hmm. as it were, that the dominant cultural memory of World War I for much of the 20th century was of the experience of those who served in the trenches. And now we're starting to see, 100 yeah. years later, a reassertion of, of quote-unquote purpose by those in leadership. I wonder if you could comment on that, if that that's makes any a, sense. A, that's a fascinating observation. I think that's absolutely right. We, because we've seen a reawakening of geopolitics, effectively. Um, you know, geopolitics, you might think that the Cold War was all about geopolitics. It wasn't geopolitics in the same sense. Now you've got this multipolar geopolitics, which is much more complex, this complex ge geometry of different, you know, powers engaged in a sort of, you know, in, in, in not exactly random interaction, but in rather unpredictable, in, unpredictable interactions. And there, you know, reading the international context and formulating policy and so on, suddenly the premium, the, the focus is on that in a way that it wasn't. Um, and certainly, as you say, the literature of the First World War has been completely dominated by the Tommy Atkins, the, the trenches, and the poilu, and all this kind of thing. And the, the men who, for all their differences, were all basically the same young men dying in these, in, you know, in, in these horrible places. And a return to the idea of political purpose. And I think that that's absolutely right. And that's why we're rereading this war now. Um, because we're, uh, because the affinity, it's because of the affinities between that moment and this one. Um, it's changed, and that, but that, that of course, it also reveals something paradoxical and slightly self-defeating about the whole business of building historical analogies, which is that we can't escape from the fact that the history we see is filtered through our present preoccupations. And we have to just, we just have to sort of acknowledge that and be honest about it um, and be extra careful not to, you know, project into that past scenario um, something that isn't actually there and for which we can't find contemporary evidence. But, you know, the fact is that that's how contemporaries read these conflicts in a, in, a, in a geopolitical way, and they focus very much on these issues of purpose and, con and um, uh, the resolution of interests and so the resolution of, in resolution of interest conflicts uh, in a way that, you know, once again, seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, whereas diplomatic history, as you probably, uh, anybody here who has worked in a history department in, in the States or has studied history will know that diplomatic history fell profoundly out of fashion mm. for a very long period. Um, and I think it may be, once again, uh, back on the up. Thank you for a, a fascinating discussion. My name is Bob Pollard from CSAS, and I'm a uh, former Cold War historian. So everything you're you're saying is this re, uh, just reawakening some uh, wonderful memories of historiography in graduate <laughs> school. Um, you know, two things. First of all, I think the reason it's so fascinating this topic, and and you you've covered it so well, is that there's still a lot of mysteries. I mean, yeah. on the one hand. Um, I, I think I agree with you, most people would, that there's a lot of a series of unforeseen uh, consequences to a series of accidents. On the other hand, you know, you think there's always a counter to that argument. This was the age of globalization. This was a time of, of a tremendous international communication and trade, a gold, you know, a gold standard. There was, uh, borders were fairly open. Europe was unified in the sense that you had, well, min minorities of population mm. scattered in all these countries. It was the European Union it was, of yes. its day. And it's still hard to believe that it happened. But my question is, it gets back to the historiography. Um, you know, the, I think for many Americans, the question is the consequences of the peace. That's the, that's the part that we, you know, most of us, we, uh, you know, remember, it's particularly in the context of the Cold War. And I, I was wondering, where do you come out on that? I mean, there's the one argument, you know, John Maynard Keynes, that the reparations uh, and the territorial dismemberment of Germany was so harsh that that set the seeds for Great Depression, fascism, mm. fascism in the World War II. Then there's the Fritz Fischer, you know, War of Illusions <coughs> argument that if you look at what the Germans were doing to the Russians during their occupation and their mm. plans uh, for Europe if they had won the war, 
that in fact Germany got off rather lightly. Mm. So I'd just be interested to hear your views. Thank you very much. Yes, that's a really difficult question. I think that, um, you know, um, the, uh, yeah, I think that the, the Versailles Treaty, the, 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 what, what the situation with Germany is that we have to remember that several things happen in Germany at once and it's hard to, um, to quantify exactly the, the impact of the individual strands of what takes place in Germany at the end of the First World War. First, there's the fact that you know, they've been through the war. So like all belligerents, they've, they're dealing with mass death and all the consequences of that, and the, the dislocation um, caused by the war and also by the blockade and so on, in the last, um, especially in the last 18 months of the war effort. Um, add to that the fact that then they're one of the defeated parties, so it doesn't end in victory. So there's no way of bestowing meaning on all of this, this sacrifice and loss. Um, and, but that they're not alone there. I mean, um, other states are, have also lost, Austria and so on, though, um, you know, and Hungary. Um, and then add to that the fact that the end of the war is followed by a period of extreme political instability. I mean, you know, um, a Soviet Republic in, in Bavaria, you know, widespread fear of a sort of Sovietization of Germany. Now, these fears, of course, became, uh, you know, huge mythical uh, monsters in the minds of, ex in particular, of the extreme right. But there's no question about the, the dislocating effect of, and so you've got to see the tandem relation between, I mean, um, Otto, Otto Braun, the social democratic minister president of Prussia, who was sort of one of the big machine politi politicians of social democracy in Germany between the wars, he wrote in his memoirs, he said, two things explain the collapse of the Weimar Republic, Versailles and Moscow. Mm -hmm. So it was the two things, the fact that you had the Russian Revolution, which of course the Germans helped to bring about, um, the Bolshevik Revolution, that is, the creation of a Bolshevik order in the East, a Soviet order in the East, fear of Sovietization in Germany on the one hand, on the other hand, the kind of what was regarded as, as the schmach, the stain of war guilt, right, which is, although the word guilt is not... Oops! <laughs> Cell phone! <laughs> that's it. I hope that's not a, a, something being patched in from the Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> check that! <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, th th it's all sort of interwoven. Um, I th of course, you know, I don't think, uh, pe pe I'm often asked in Germany, you know, uh, you, uh, surely then the Versailles Treaty was utterly wrong and so on and so forth. Well, I mean, you, you know, the, it was the demand for, the Versailles Peace is unusual in the sense that it doesn't carry with it the kind of forgetfulness clauses that had been qual a characteristic of many earlier peace treaties. You know, m early, the European peace treaty tradition always included the traditional documents always included a treaty saying, you know, we will forget the, the harms caused and we will try and create a post-war order. Because you have to forget the, the harms in order to move on. Versailles doesn't do that. It says there's a guilty party. And on the ba basis of that, reparations will be extracted. Of course, reparations are nothing new. But attaching them to guilt, to responsibility, was new. Mm -hmm. And the Germans felt that very keenly. On the other hand, I think that, um, you know, there's nothing... Th it's completely understandable that the Allies did that. It also has to do with the fact that the German war effort was not free of atrocities. I mean, you have the atrocities in Belgium, um, the Austrian atrocities in Serbia. Um, of course, the Entente has its own atrocities. The Russians carried out very extensive pogroms and, and killings in, in Galicia, and, um, and there are killings in East Prussia and so on. But uh, and the one thing doesn't weigh up the other. You know, it doesn't outweigh, it doesn't, doesn't as it were, neutralize the other, cancel out the other. But um, I can understand why something like the Versailles Treaty was regarded as, as you know, unavoidable in the situation of 1919. So I don't want to really buy into a kind of revisionist rejection of Versailles. Um, it was just an expression of the post-war order that had established itself in the aftermath of, of um, the German defeat. So, um, yeah, I but I suppose that, that, the, that, that what I would say about the Fritz Fischer argument, Fritz Fischer is very interesting. If we come back to this question that you asked about you know, how we're returning to a geopolitical reading of what was happening in 1914, um, or thinking more about what statesmen uh, were doing and how they calculated each other's intentions and so on, or tried to predict each other's acts. Um, if we could say in that respect that we're being sensitized to aspects of the past through a new, new dimensions of our present, then that was true of Fritz Fischer, I think, as well. Fritz Fischer was sensitized to, to German culpability by his own, you know, um, very pained sense of compromise as a result of his relationship with National Socialism. And it's that whole um, movement away, attempt to decontaminate the German present by inculpating the German past. And there's an extent to which I think he backdates you know, issues of culpability, a sense of contamination, which really has to do about with the period 33 to 45. Uh, he backdates that, or it, it, it frames his view 
of the actions of the German leadership in 19, before 1914. Um, that doesn't mean that Fischer made up his sources. He, he made very important discoveries, and it's a very powerful, they're very powerful books. But they're, the thing about Fischer is he was interested in Germany. He wasn't interested in what anybody else was doing. It was a very domestic, a very um, German-focused investigation. But you can do a Fischer if you wanted to. You could do a Fischer for, for the Russians and say, look, here's a nasty statement. Here's an ag aggressive, belligerent um, you know, letter from a minister, and so on and so forth. You could put together a kind of sound, you know, a carpet of sound bites um, to, to, to create a psychogram of, of the Russian elite. And you'd find plenty of belligerence, paranoia, and aggression there, just as you do in Berlin, in Vienna, and indeed even in Paris. So you know, um, that's, I suppose, how I would respond to the, to the reference you made to, to Fischer. Great. We have a question in the back and then a question here. Uh, Britt Mitchell, Renaissance Institute, Baltimore. We do travel down here sometimes. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I sat in this very room about three weeks ago. Largest crowd that's ever been here at CSIS was reported, 688 people. Great in, event. In this room? Well, this, well it's, it's opened up. <laughs> they all opened up. And the balcony out here was just loaded with people as well. Are you trying to make me feel bad about no. the smallness no, of the No, no. <laughs> You're a rock star. I've, I've done what you've done many times. <laughs> But uh, I sat in the room, and uh, Bob Schaefer was the panel leader, and he called on Brent Scowcroft to deliver his 10-minute perspective of what's going on. And I'm a social psychologist, so sitting in with that crowd of people, some of which are here right now, it was interesting, the tension in the room, until Brent Scowcroft went all the way back to when the Swedes moved down into the Asia line to the east. And he went and explained it, uh, the situation in terms of historical significance and mm. social significance. Uh, and when he finally got to the end where he said, this problem is not a here and now problem. He said it wasn't a here and now problem at World War I and it wasn't back in 1735. It's a continual thing. Yep. My question then is, and by the way, Within 15 seconds, I looked around and the entire room just sat back in their seats. You could literally hear the war fever leave the room mm. when they were faced with factual information. Now, my question is, we're going to keep on doing this, and it's never going to stop until we get to the point where we begin to tackle that flaw in human socialization. Had, do you know of any group of people that are trying to do that to realize that where two tectonic plates come together, you are always going to have war and violence until you understand it and stop it? And if, if I may, Chris, let's take another question because yes. we're getting close to why we'll have to come through. There it is, microphone we're right there. <coughs> yeah, I'm Michael Barone with American Enterprise Institute. Uh, in your talk, you talked about the danger today that you think may. Uh, Western leaders may be, uh, may be take facing in trying to avoid a confrontation um, by failing to provide clear signals to Putin. And as I read the Sleepwalkers, one of the things that I remember is Sir Edward Gray uh, with his wonderful ambiguity uh, mm. to his uninterested cabinet colleagues and to the rest of the world, which contributed to the result uh, yeah. in some significant way. Um, do you see, I, I mean, I worry about a danger that the red lines that we have supposedly created by the accession to the NATO alliance of Poland and the Baltic states uh, may be transgressed by Putin and that we find ourselves uh, not in Serbia but in Estonia or something in a possible war situation. How serious do you think that is? Mm. Yeah. And I'm going to add one last one to this wonderful menu. Yes. Um, it feels as if we're witnessing the second collapse of the Soviet Union in some ways through this experience, whether it's the reformulation of, of a Eurasia Union. Um, it, as we saw 100 years ago, as empires collapse, there's still aftershocks and after effects. Uh, I could argue and witness in watching the Hungarian elections that they're still talking about the Treaty of Trianon and, and mm -hmm. empires. I mean, these expressions have not left Europe and they're still formulating political <laughs> narratives today. Mm. I just wonder if you could reflect on 
the continuation of empire collapses and what they need in a, in a modern context. Yeah. Well, wow, three really rich, rich and challenging questions. Okay, to begin with, the, 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 the toughest one really is the one about is there an answer to this problem of social psychology? And um, I mean, I, when you were saying that, I was thinking the Quakers, uh, you know, the, the peace movements, um, they, they probably aren't the answer or they don't have, the, have answers. Um, it's one of those questions where I feel like I want to say, you know, if I had the answer to that question, I wouldn't be sitting here or something <laughs> like that. You know, um, but it's, uh, I think you're quite right. There are, there, there are fundamental flaws in the, in the uh, and, you know, there are, and there's, a, of course, I'm, I'm actually not an expert in this. I think you know, my, my, I, I'm, I'm intuiting that you know much more about this than I do, but there's a fascinating literature, which I looked at briefly, but never found a way of actually integrating into my analysis on questions like why hawks so often win arguments. You know, why is it that when hawks and doves go into the lists against each other in, in situations where, where people are having an argument, why do the hawks so often prevail? Um, and there are all sorts of psychological reasons why, why you know, hawkish arguments often work better. Psychologically, they, they tap people's emotional energies more effectively than uh, dovish arguments do. Uh, because they work with anxiety and you know, anxieties which may be you know, you know, related to real threats that actually exist. Um, so you know, um, that's as, good much as far as I can go in the direction of a good answer to your question. I don't really have one. But I think you're absolutely right. The fundamental assumption is right, that there's a, a very deep flaw in how we manage conflicts. Um, I think that structures can be part of the answer. Um, the EU is a structure which um, would not have been possible if, if the lessons of both world wars hadn't been learned, at least for the continent itself. And I think it's one of the greatest achievements in human history, the European Union. And um, that's why I'm so anxious about its future. But, um, you know, I think in the end, we have to find ways of solving these problems that don't depend on the social psychology, the, on the psychology of individuals and processes of socialization. Uh, humans are always going to let us down, you know, um, but, you know, robust structures can help humans to be, you know, can, can make their failures less disastrous. Um, yes, the ambiguity of gray, the red lines and the Baltics, uh, this is also my anxiety because I do think there have to be red, real red lines. And, um, you know, um, Poland is one where I think, you know, we simply c cannot give an inch on that. Um, the Baltics are another. Um, you know, despite the presence of Russians in a country like Latvia, um, that has to be, you know, the, the West obviously is going to have to, that it would be a very serious um, diminution of our commitment to the order established in the aftermath of the Cold War to relax the vigilance on any of those red lines. So I think you're absolutely right. That could be a problem. But the key there is very, very clear signaling about what is, what is up for negotiation and what's not. Um, and at the moment, I think probably that signaling is sort of working. I mean, overflights by, you know, uh, re the reinforcement of border facilities, of, of, of um, you know, boundary defense facilities, overflights by American planes, all this kind of thing, that's, that's helpful and sends clear signals. Um, you know, I just very much hope that we won't be tested on that because that could be very dangerous. But, I, but you know, then th the question comes to, the, to, the qu qu to, to a question about the kind of politician and the kind of man Vladimir Putin is. I don't think he's insane. I don't think he's a psychopath. I don't think, I think comparisons between Putin and Hitler are completely barking up the wrong tree. He doesn't have a, a vision of politics which is grossly and radically at odds with everybody else's the way Hitler did. Um, you know, I, I think he's acting rationally. He's acting aggressively, aggressively and provocatively, but rash rationally. Um, and we have to assume that he'll continue to do that, uh, at least that he'll continue to act rationally. Uh, and hope that he doesn't continue to act aggressively. So, um, not a very good answer to that question either. But a very difficult question. But I, um, but I think that you know, um, firmness and clarity about the resolution of the West in defending the real red lines um, on behalf of NATO me members is crucial. Um, I'm as astonished by you are as you are by the kind of uh, the ability. It's like these. Um, these viruses or these tardigrades, these tiny living creatures which can sort of go to sleep on an asteroid for several thousand years and then wake up again when they, when they, when they encounter moisture and warmth. <laughs> you know, um, there's something about the, this, these, these imperial discourses which seems able to, be, to reawaken into, into, into rude life. It's like mummies suddenly climbing out of their boxes. Um, and, <coughs> you know, the extraordinary reawakening of sensitivity around Trianon is, is, is very striking in Hungary. 
Of course, it's fed in part by ongoing grievances about Hungarians in R Romania and uh, in Hungarian diasporas in, uh, in other countries. But um, yes, but it is, it is extraordinary. And it's um, why it's happening is, di is difficult to say. It's clearly linked to the end of the Cold War in some way um, and to the revival of nationalism, which seems not to be able to find any it seems to be reaching back into the past rather than, rather than adopting. Nationalism was once a vision of the future. It was once a vision about a coherent, modern um, you know, enterprise with infrastructures and a national press and this kind of thing. It was driven by the, by, by, by the wealthiest, by the elites, not, by, not from below. But this nationalism seems to be feeding on a kind of you know, an archive of, of partly remembered historical um, uh, myths and partly, remember, uh, partly remembered historical half-truths. Uh, and that's a very worrying development, but it's an, an important one. We, uh, another, another feature of the contemporary landscape that we need to be vigilant about. And that's, of course, why historians matter. That's why historians are not just, you know, a pointless decoration. Um, they're actually there because history is the best protection we have against myth. Um, historians don't always get it right and they don't agree with each other, but at least they're committed to an honest conversation based on the best information we have to hand about the past. Um, which is, of course, what the mythmongers and the nationalists and the imperial imperialists um, uh, are not committed to. Well, Professor Clark, that's why you are so important, why Sleepwalkers is so important, and this has been a fantastic conversation. The rain would not stop us and prevent us from hearing. Uh, we haven't stopped the rain either. We haven't stopped the rain <laughs> either. You know, this morning I was reading, um, Prime Minister Medvedev had a Facebook, and I was reading that, and I thought, in pre preparing for this, I thought, you know what, if Twitter was around, what would Kaiser Wilhelm have tweeted out in oh, 1914? I, I, I dread to I think. I cannot <laughs> even imagine. Uh, but uh, again, thank you. This has thank been you much. just extraordinary. I thank you all for joining us. Thank and you I very hope much for coming. And I you'll come back again. But please join me in thanking Professor Clark. Thank you very much.